Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm about to present. Okay, here we are. Okay, good. Let me smooth this down a little bit. No. This way. Okay. Should be fine. Okay, there we go. Alright, so, Cladistics, Chapter 26.3. By Professor Bender. That's me. That is also me. Okay, so cladistics is the classification of species based on evolutionary relationships. Scientists use cladistics as a method to discriminate among possible phylogenetic trees. In my section, phylogenetic trees will now be referred to as cladograms. That's just a scientific term in cladistics. So, I'll show you how cladistics discriminates among possible phylogenetic trees. Um, right here. So, cladistics compares characters, also known as homologous traits, which may exist in different character states. An example of a character would be a front limb, and this one character may appear in different character states, such as an arm, like us human beings, a wing, like birds, and this picture that did not load, but it was a picture of a flipper like a dolphin or a fish's flipper. So, I know you guys are a little confused. I'm going to tell you two more terms and then I'll, incorpor I'll incorporate everything we just learned so far into a diagram. So, the, this uh, first term is, the sh is called the shared primitive character, scientifically known as the simple isomorphy. Uh, a, a shared primitive character is a character that is shared by a group of species and inherited from a distant ancestor older than their last common ancestor. The shared derived character, also known as a synapomorphy, is a character that is shared by two or more species or taxa and has originated in their most recent common ancestor. That's key. That is the most recent common ancestor. So here is a simple cladogram. If the character in the cladogram is front limbs, what are the character states? So as you can see, the character is given for front limbs. They all have front limbs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, what, what would be the two character states, ladies and gentlemen? Give me a few seconds. If you guys said flippers and arms, you are correct. Our next uh, question. A shared primitive character is having two eyes. What is a shared derived character and which ancestor did it come from? So, if a shared primitive character is having two eyes, and shared primitive character is a character that is derived from their uh, latest ancestor. So A has two eyes, which means all of these guys have two eyes and that's your shared primitive character because A had it but a shared derived character would be flippers for D and E because their oldest ancestor A did not have flippers but their most recent common ancestor B does have flippers uh, the next term is the is called an in-group. 
Each cladogram has an in-group and an out-group. The in-group is a group of species in a cladogram that scientists want to study. <sighs> um, and just a fact, all the species in the in-group always have the same shared derived character. Character or characters. That's what makes them the in-group. The out-group is a species or group of species that lacks the derived character that the in-group has in the cladogram. Uh, so, and the species in the out-group lack the derived character because they have diverged from the in-group species during evolution before they could obtain that character. So, if you guys are confused, don't worry, I'm about to incorporate these two new terms in a nice diagram over here. So, here's an, another uh, cladogram. Let's go for an, our next question. If the salmon, lizard, and rabbit are the in-group, what species would be the out-group and why? Well, so we have the salmon, lizard, and rabbit as the in-group. Um, they're the, they are the in-group because they share the same derived character, which is the hinged jaw. So the lamprey would be the out-group because it does not have a hinged jaw that all three in-group species have. So that's the out-group. And why? It's because the lamprey does not have the hinged jaw. Next question. For the in-group, what is the shared primitive character and what is the shared derived character? Well, um, as we just went over, the shared derived character is easy. That's what makes them the in-group. Uh, that would be the hinged jaw. The shared primitive character would be the notochord and the vertebrae because these two characteristics uh, came from their the lancelet and lamprey which is their older ancestors next um, if if you were a researcher whoa if you were a researcher and you wanted to propose a cladogram you can't just research all your stuff nicely and then decide you're going to publish it. It's just not how it works. So you have to follow these six simple steps to make sure you can propose your cladogram. First step, step one, choose the species in whose evolutionary relationships you are interested in. Pretty basic. Step two, choose the characters for comparing the species selected. Makes sense, right? Because all the cladograms we've looked at today both have these characters. They have species and they have characteristics. Step three, determine if a character state came first and is primitive or came later and is a derived character. So basically what step three is saying is once you have your cladogram drawn out, label the characters being derived or primitive. Step four, make sure the cladogram is following the basic cladogram principles. Um, I believe there are three principles, but I have one in the example below. And that one principle is that each cladogram branch point should have a list of one or more shared derived characters that are common to all species above the branch point unless the character is later modified. So what that example is saying is um, if we go back all the way to this guy notice how it goes up and then it branches out goes up branches out goes up branches out those are branch points and at each branch point it's to have a character 
labeled. So at one branch point, you have a nodal cord, another branch point, vertebrae, branch point, hinge jaw. That's what it's uh, talking about. I just had to explain that to you guys because it's not easy to understand that without a cladogram in front of you. So, step five. Choose the cladogram that provides the simplest explanation for the data. So basically what step five is saying is if you're making a cladogram, don't have bizarre like reasoning for evolutionary relationships. Make it simple. Make it rudimentary. And then you'll be all right. Step six. Create an outgroup that must be non-controversial in that it shows enough distinctive differences with the in-group to be considered a clear out-group. So what this is saying is, you must have an out-group in your cladogram. You must have an in-group and an out-group. And the out-group sometimes is controversial. But you need to make sure that your out-group is not controversial and that it lacks the derived characters and yeah. And the reason why an outgroup is so important is because it pro it provides a root to the phylogenetic tree. Okay, last part of my uh, section is how to choose between cladograms. So basically, this is a real life thing. Uh, scientists or researchers they have a bunch of cladograms of the same species, and proposing the evolutionary relationships of that same group of species but there's many cladograms so they need to figure out which one is the best and which one they could publish to the scientific world so they do this by following these three steps the first is the principle of parsimony this states that the preferred hypothesis or cladogram is the one that is the simplest for all characters and their states Basically, saying that if you have two cladograms and one is simple, short, to the point, and everything makes sense, and if you have one that is really complex and controversial, you'll obviously follow the principle of parsimony and choose the one that is uh, simple, the simplest. Next is the maximum likelihood method. Now, when I was reading about this method, boy, was it confusing. But lucky for you guys, you have me to spend 15 minutes analyzing this method and figuring out what's, like, what it's about. So basically, what it says is, the phylogenetic tree that gives the higher probability of producing the observed data is preferred to any trees that gives a lower probability. So what this is saying is, if you have two cladograms and one and you have all your observed data the one that makes more sense the one that you know is going to uh, produce your observed data is what is the one you should choose opposed to one that has a lower probability of producing or of, of depicting your observed data Lastly, we have the Bayesian method. This was also kind of complex, not as much complex as the maximum likelihood method, but once again, you guys are lucky. Uh, this one basically asked the question, what is the probability that a particular phylogenetic tree is correct given the observed data and particular evolutionary model? So this is basically saying, once you have the phylogenetic tree that passed the, these first two steps. Just take a look at it and say, does this phylogenetic tree actually depict the observed data? Does it? That's what you gotta ask yourself. And yeah, scientists will use all three of these me uh, method principles to pick the, group, the best phylogenetic tree. And yeah, that's cladistics for you hope this helped. I'll be lecturing on the 27th during bio. You guys can email me with any questions. You guys can definitely ask questions tomorrow during the lecture. I have like five seconds to go on this. So I gotta finish. Alright, see you guys.